and hello viewers thanks for keeping it property focus your window into the world of architecture building construction and real estate now ladies you said you want something for the women in the built environment and we got that for you the hashtag is choose to challenge for the women in today's episode every year we dedicate this one to celebrating women's achievements in the built environment because collectively we can help create an inclusive world this is your most insightful property show in the country and we lined up a guest of three phenomenal ladies we couldn't get them all unfortunately till next time but welcome to yet another amazing episode i'm your host peter ngigi Now, thanks for keeping it property focused. Now, as always, we say the most important thing is engaging qualified personnel when working on every aspect of your building. However, many people avoid professionals and construction firms in an effort to be prudent, but end up losing so much more money due to pilferage and shoddy work. If you follow the show, you know it's about cutting costs and not corners. Let's hear from our first guest, Diana Musioka. Let's go. Good. Now, you know, it's all about cutting costs and not cutting corners. We've always insisted on this. And our very first guest today is none other than Diana. Welcome to Property Focus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Tell us about yourself. Um, my name is Diana Mumbua Musioka. I'm a quantity surveyor. Uh, graduated in the year 2006. have been practicing for the last 15 years. Uh, 13 years in employment and uh, two years in my own private practice, uh, which is now Epic Value Consultants Limited. Um, also a founding member in uh, Women in Real Estate, and uh, I'm also an associate arbitrator. Now, before we get into anything, who is a QS and what is your role in a building project? A quantity surveyor is um, basically a consultant who comes in to assist the client in terms of budget uh, in construction, in coming up with the budget, first of all, uh, and then, uh, of course, managing the budget into the construction uh, process. Uh, we also help in a lot in procurement, in getting who you're going to work with. Uh, we assist also in legal aspects. We are well trained in terms of legal aspects and uh, coming up with contracts and uh, yeah, uh, finance aspect in project. Okay. Yes. So tell us about a project that you've worked on. I've been involved in uh, quite a bit of commercial projects and uh, residential projects. Um, uh, enough of office spaces. Uh, I've ventured into banking spaces. I've also done uh, some luxurious homes also in Kirarapon. Uh, some uh, res residential home again, also in uh, Ruiru. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, quite a bit, an array of projects, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Now you had mentioned you had saved a client costs with a particular project. Definitely, definitely. One case in scenario is that uh, we recently had a client who had never quite done a construction building and uh, having involved consultants and having done his uh, residential house at a record time of nine months, pretty was impressive on his end, having not known about consultants in the first place. And uh, we did a lot of cost savings for him based on advices we gave him uh, in procurement. So that's some of the project that I'm really proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you describe a time when you went over the budget? Cost overruns, yes, uh, has happened enough times for re various reasons. But uh, uh, on a certain project that I would, I would, I would want to say is that um, we, we changed cost based on specifications that the client wanted a higher sort of finish. And, uh, you know, if he gauges the market and he sees this, the uptake would be probably more. So we changed specifications uh, to a higher spec of finish. And our input in this is that we are coming in to advise you what does this do to your project or how does this Im impact in terms of re your returns of investment just before you make that decision. So hence why we insist that we need to be involved throughout the project uh, uh, period. So aside from academic qualifications, what other skills does one need to thrive in this industry? Yes, I would say being organized. Um, you need to be very up in terms of how you keep your documentation and, um, you know, retrieving this in terms when you're, you're getting into a dispute and, and even when client is asking questions about his project, you need to be very well organized. You need to be a planner. As I said, you come in pretty early in terms of construction. 
So you need to plan through a project. You need to be the one focusing anything that might happen in the project so that you don't end up in disputes. Um, more so, you need to be a negotiator. I'm, I'm in a construction site on behalf of a client, so I have to be the one negotiating things in terms of pricing, in terms of contract, so that skill really helps me. Yeah. In spirit with International Women's Day, what challenge do you choose to challenge? Well, I choose to challenge women to work with each other more, give each other business. Um, I also choose to challenge them to network more, mentor more women, you know, mentor more women in construction, mentor more women in take up leadership positions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any advice to women out there? We most of the time are told that uh, construction is basically a male dominated field. I would want to demystify that fact um, and uh, say that we we are actually existing in this space and I would encourage more women to be more developers, be the, the, the architect that we are looking forward to working with, be the QS that people are looking to you know, work with and involve you in projects. And we have several other women have done this before you, so please join in. Now you mentioned WIRE, how has it impacted the industry? That to me was one passionate move. I have uh, honestly benefited in uh, women in real estate. This is a society that was brought together to encourage, empower, and give, and give women spaces in terms of networking. And uh, we have, I think, accomplished this in helping women take up more leadership positions. And uh, we have also had uh, a mentorship program put in place. So we have mentorship in very different levels, including myself, I have been mentored through in wire in starting my business up, in keeping it running even through COVID times. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would encourage more women to join in, get in the space. Uh, I mean, it's also what you're bringing into it. It's not more of what you're going to gain into it. We need more mentors, we need, we need more leaders. So yes, I would encourage more people to join in to wire, and basically more in construction industry, of course. So there's one question that everybody is asking. Who's better between men and women in terms of QSs? I, I would say I, 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 have, I have taken up my space better. I have, um, sorry, I, 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 I have enjoyed being a QS. I, I enjoy the bit that being a negotiator and of course being a male dominated field, I'm coming in to negotiate with mostly men. Uh, of course, who is going to get a better price if you put in a had a skill and you know you'd need a soft environment for such things I, 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 would, I would say we, we probably might be we are <laughs> well thank you very much Diana okay you're welcome good good and there you have it the fairer gender actually are better QS's than the men now hashtag choose to challenge you had one phenomenal woman we're gonna take a short commercial break and when we're back We've got our second guest. Stay tuned. And welcome back from the break. And we've got our second lady who's an interior architect. I never knew what that is, but we're going to find out today who advocates for sustainable design as a way of improving spaces in which we work and live. Emphasizing on the future of architecture being a direct interaction with nature, a board member of the Women in Real Estate, Assistant Secretary of the Architectural Association of Kenya, Diana, in a free time, explores creative interior spaces in and around Nairobi with the hashtag Space of Nairobi. Let's hear all about Diana in just a bit. Hi, Diana. Hi, Peter. Welcome to Property Focus. Thank you. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> My name is Diana Machoka. Mm -hmm. I'm a graduate architect and I'm practicing as an interior architect. And I'm also a woman in real estate. Wonderful. Yes. Who is an interior architect and what is the role of an interior architect in a project? Well, an interior architect I, I would describe as a problem solver of space. So it's a marriage between interior design and architecture. Mm -hmm. So the, it's a three-pronged job covering space, fu space planning, functionality, and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. What that means is that we are involved from the preliminary design with the architectural design team 
planning out the space, making sure it makes sense to the users, making sure the flow of space makes sense, and then we carry on with the design team throughout site visits, throughout the implementation, and ensuring the final users, the client, enjoys the space that mm -hmm. we have created. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Are there projects that you've worked on that you're particularly proud of? Yes, there are, there are quite a number that I'm proud of, but mm -hmm. the one that stands out to me is a residential project that we did in Siokimau. Tell us more. I like it because mm -hmm. we were in, I was personally involved in the design team from conception mm -hmm. to construction, complete to interior design. I have a background in architecture. I studied architecture in university. And so it was interesting for me to see how my skills from my architectural course mm -hmm. covered throughout the, the project until mm -hmm. we got to the interior design part. Okay. Yeah. Now in such a male, heavily male-dominated industry, what else does it take to succeed other than your qualifications? Number one, I'd say in the skills that one needs in such an industry is communication skills. Because like you said, it's male dominated and sometimes asserting yourself or standing up for yourself can come out as aggressive. But learning how to communicate with different personality types, different genders, male, women, different professions, whether it's the engineers, the QSs, the foreman on site, you have to learn how to communicate to the different personalities mm -hmm. while still standing up for yourself so that you're not overlooked or taken advantage of. Yeah. Yes. Now, we're looking at a theme which is choose to challenge on International Women's Day. What do you choose to challenge? I choose to challenge gender inequality and mm -hmm. gender bias, especially for women in the built environment and especially for women in leadership. Um, the currently, the, the statistics for the number of female architects registered by the Board of Registered Architects stands at 11%, which is wow. a drop yes. from, that's these statistics are for 2020, which is a drop by 4% from 2019. I know there are factors that, like the COVID-19 pandemic, affected the number of people who are sitting for exams and people who are on projects on site. But I think encouraging more women to join the profession is the way to go. And especially in leadership, I'd commend uh, the leading association of architects in Kenya currently mm -hmm. has been under the leadership of women for the past two terms. And I think that's a step up, but I think we can go further as women. Mm -hmm. yes. you, can, you can still do more. Yes. Wonderful. And this is information according to Borax. Yes. Wonderful. Any advice to women out there? I'd advise them to level up and not let their place at the table be taken by anyone else. I think as women sometimes we tend to take a step back and let other people sit at the table and make decisions for us. But I think uh, the challenge and I'd advise more women to stand up for themselves it takes the it's about your voice my voice your voice personally mm -hmm. taking a self-leadership mm -hmm. leader of self wonderful diana most asked question between men and women who are better interior architects and obviously say women <laughs> 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 i feel like women yeah. have you know there's a softer side mm -hmm. to to the to the business of architecture it's not just about function at mm -hmm. the end of the day yeah. you want to create a space that people like mm -hmm. that people would yes. enjoy and you know feel like it's home and I, I wouldn't lie i think women are more have that home feel mm -hmm. about them well, yeah I, I feel at home with this interview <laughs> well thank you very much diana thank you peter so we've got the hashtag which is uh, choose to challenge yes. with your right hand in the air yes good good so we're spot on yeah uh there we have it from our second guest and up next we've got a couple of billboards to show you what deals are out in the market and then we're going to our third guest to just find out a bit more and find out who that is in just a moment stay tuned
Unlock a world full of divine moments, graceful memories, and treasured experiences. Indulge in a magical fusion of nature, art, and architecture in the heart of Westlands at Kenzie Residence. Deeply connect with the most distinct features, mind-blowing views, and delightful amenities while immersed in utmost elegance. Book your studio one or two bedroom unit starting from 4 million shillings and enjoy our flexible four-year payment plan. Call us today on 0728 0002 or visit our website on www.safeproperties.com. Brilliant. Tell us about yourself. My name is Etta Madete. I'm an environmental architectural designer based here in Nairobi. I've been practicing for about four years. I graduated in 2017. So you're not just an architect, but an environmental architect. Tell us about your role in building projects. An environmental designer basically makes sure that the building that is being produced has thought through how it's impacting the environment around us. Mm -hmm. um, and in that regard, it is trying to be as sustainable as possible. Mm -hmm. And the UN defines sustainability as meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of future generations. What that means is very simply, leave it better than you, le you found it. Um, and that's what environmental designers do. We try to ensure that the building is energy efficient, it is not wasting energy, and it is also water efficient, trying to make sure it's not wasting water or it is using as little water as possible. Um, and also making sure that the materials being used in the building are sensible. When I say sensible is that you're not bringing materials from really far away unnecessarily, like importing goods in which can be found in the local region. It is also using materials which have low embodied carbon and what that means is that it's materials which have have used little energy to be to be manufactured mm -hmm. i'll give an example of steel mm -hmm. steel is a great material it's very strong very lightweight however it takes a lot of heat mm -hmm to create steel, steel members. Um, so for example, on the other hand, you have timber. And timber made from commercially viable forests, so not from indigenous forests, from commercial forests. Those are easily and locally available, and they're warm, and they're also naturally re re reproducing. So it's renewable. So you can keep planting more commercial trees to be able to replace that, as well as the fact that it's, 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 it's warm, and it, the people using the space enjoy working with timber, and um, you know, it's warm basically um, so an environmental designer basically works with a design or with an architectural team as well as being part of a, pro of a project team to really ensure that the energy or the water or the materials that are being used are done in a way that they do not, they do not negatively impact the environment but beyond that there's a the physical aspect of ensuring that you know the building is good for the environment, but it's also the social aspect. So for sustainability, you need to ensure that there's inclusivity and accessibility. And this goes also for like women and, and the disabled and all different vulnerable groups who have been traditionally excluded from the design and the production of the spaces around us. Mm -hmm. Yet all users of the space should have a say in how they've been designed mm -hmm. because you know as a woman how you want your spaces to be designed or how they work for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's ensuring that there's inclusivity in how spaces are produced, how uh, urban spaces are produced, how our cities are designed. Um, and so beyond just, you know, the physical and ensuring that there's thermal comfort and that people are comfortable and that spaces are, for example, for example naturally lit and naturally ventilated, we are also working to ensure inclusivity, accessibility, that all groups have a say in how these spaces are produced mm -hmm. and designed. Mm -hmm. Other than the qualifications, what are the skills supplementary to qualification help in becoming a thriving environmental designer or architect? Apart from the qualifications, of course, mm -hmm. you need to expose yourself to as many types of spaces as possible. Um, you find that growing up, you're, growing up in Nairobi, for example, you only know stone and concrete. That's how buildings are everywhere you go. So you need to expose yourself to different ways of building, different innovations, and challenge yourself and the engineers that you're working on. So you need to be able to be very persuasive to, so that people can feel like they're able to explore a little bit more. And secondly, it's also be really keen on new tools and new technologies coming in. As the world is moving towards um, being more aware about environmental sustainability and climate change, there's a lot of new innovations that are coming out and being open and really exposing yourself to all these innovations that are coming in and how they can be applied in the local context. 
and their tools, their rating tools, for example, there's building codes that are really shifting. Our building code is also shifting mm -hmm. to accommodate environmental and sustainable mm -hmm. design. So being part of that space, um, being part of that network and really beginning to drive that change. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Now it's International Women's Day coming up tomorrow. And in light of the theme, what do you choose to challenge? I choose to challenge that women cannot be part of the entire value chain of construction. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is that even right now with all the strides you've made, we are still pigeonholing ourselves to like very specific design of specific spaces or specific um, centers or specific buildings. But I believe they can be in the entire value chain. So just to give an idea, despite the strides you've made, there are only 11% of registered architects in Kenya who are women, 11%. And for that, I, I think, okay, we've made progress. But what about the entire value chain from the lawyers who are doing legal tenders in the real estate, from people, from women in home ownership, from the education sector who are training women in the construction sector, from builders, people who are constructing. I mean, there's a, there's a great company that's also working towards training women in construction because it's an illusion that you only need big muscles to, to build houses. Actually, there's a whole bunch of skill sets that we can all participate in in the built environment, including the design of spaces, mm -hmm. the engineers in the, in the space. Um, mm -hmm. So the entire value chain should be able to be as inclusive as possible. So I choose to challenge. It's not just a small space. Mm -hmm. We need to break glass ceilings across the board. Mm -hmm. Advice to women out there? I have one key one, which is you need to sit comfortably and confidently around that table. And I completely understand sometimes I walk into a room and I'm the only woman and I'm chairing the meeting and it's intimidating. It's a little bit scary. Um, you sort of want to conform to sort of being a little bit shy, a little bit, you know, uh, fly on the wall. But I'm telling you, if you step into that role, you, you become confident and you become more and more confident over time to realize that you're the one who's making the decision. So you need to be able to sit on the table and sit comfortably and confidently on it. Last question. Who's a better environmental architect between men and women? Good question, but I think it's in the wrong context. At the moment, we are yet to see a lot of environmental design architects. So I'd want us to revisit that when there are a lot more people, women in this space who have designed spaces which are able to sort of be counted and be charted. Mm -hmm. But I would say, yes. at the moment, from yes. the ones who are starting, mm -hmm. it's definitely women. Definitely women. There you have it, folks. Well, thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Now, you've had it from three successful women in the built environment. Stay tuned. We've got more. Wow, ladies, thanks for prompting us. And in the spirit of the theme, strike for hashtag choose to challenge. Pose with your hand in the air to our social media feeds. And remember to tag us on Property Focus on Facebook and Property underscore Focus underscore on Instagram. For more information, call our WhatsApp us on 0799078202 and we'll be in touch. Let's keep the conversations going. And ladies, wishing you a fantastic tomorrow just like you. Amazing. I've been your host, Peter Ngigi.